Thank you, Christina. If you brought your Bibles tonight, turn to Matthew, the 17th chapter, and the 21st verse. Tonight we discuss everyone's favorite topic, fasting. Yeah, glory. Just felt that thunderous well wave of anointing just crash over me right there. What is fasting and why does it work? What are the principles that enable it to increase your spiritual strength? There is a right and a wrong way to do everything. Have you ever done the right thing the wrong way and got a bad result? There's a right and a wrong way to speak the truth. The Bible says speak the truth in love. When you know what you're going to say is the truth, but it's going to have an impact on somebody, make sure they understand that you speak to them from a heart of love, not from one of hate. The Bible says there's a right and a wrong way to give, that when you give, you should do it according to Bible principles so that you'll receive what God promises are the rewards for giving. And when it comes to fasting, there is a right and a wrong way to fast. And if you do it properly, you will increase your spiritual power and your spiritual strength and be able to overcome things that you were not previously able to do. But if you do it the wrong way, you're just going to go hungry. And so I want to make sure if what you purpose to do next year is begin your year by consecrating it with a fast, which is a very strong and solid biblical principle to do, that you understand how and why to do it, the right and the wrong way, and why it works, and what you do wrong when you do not. Whenever you survey a church and you ask them of their least favorite topics, the top three are fasting, fasting, and fasting. And I can throw my hat in the ring with that bunch because anytime you talk about going without food, I believe that you better be anointed of God or you're walking a very dangerous road. Now, I recognize that there are people who eat to live. I'm not in that category. I actually live to eat. I think about my meal that I'm going to enjoy next while I'm eating the meal I'm enjoying now. And if you don't understand that, you should try it. It's a great way to live. But there's something about your physical nature that must decrease so that your spiritual nature might increase. Whenever you discuss fasting, the name Daniel gets used in vain all of the time. Well, I'm on a Daniel's fast. People use that to create a spiritual excuse for why they're seeking to achieve something that really has no impact. People want to know, well, what is a Daniel's fast? Well, if you go by the letter of the law, Daniel's fast is a 21-day fast, and it's a fast from meats, it's a fast from sugar, it's a fast from delicacies and strong drink. Now, why is it those certain things? Because Daniel was a righteous child of God in a pagan land, and a pagan king was offering meat and wine and sweet foods to a false god. He would offer them to that false god, and then he wanted the people at his table to eat them. Because they were offered to a false god, Daniel refused to eat them. It wasn't that Daniel was a vegetarian. Daniel just didn't eat what had been desecrated and defiled by a false god. If Nebuchadnezzar would have been offering carrots and Brussels sprouts to the false god, Daniel would have eaten meat. I'm depressed that the false god didn't like carrots. But here's the principles of a Daniel's fast that enable you to understand what it is and what it's not. Because I've seen people buy five-pound baked potatoes and stuff their face with them. I'm on a Daniel's fast. No, you're not. You're packing on the pounds with carbs, baby. It's gluten-free, but you're getting huge. A Daniel's fast is sacrificing things that comfort you. Things that you would give to the God of self. Just like Nebuchadnezzar gave them to his false God. Whatever it is that you like. Chocolate chip cookies? Yeah, put that on the Daniel's fast. Bluebell. How many of you were blessed when you saw it back in stores? Oh, glory. <laughs> Daniel's fast. You can't turn around and say, God, I'm giving up Brussels sprouts, bean sprouts, and mustard greens just for your glory 
Because if it doesn't mean anything to you, it won't mean anything to God. And that's a principle that you can apply to prayer, to giving, to fasting, to all things. Oftentimes, we come up with spiritual excuses that give us the opportunity to circumvent the fast whenever the Bible's very clear that there is a right and there is a wrong way to do it. And if done well, it can indeed bring great spiritual results in your life. Let's read Matthew 17 and 21 and find out more about fasting and why it works. If you found 17 and 21, say amen. amen. Jesus said to his disciples, however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Say those last three words with me, by prayer and fasting. Heavenly Father, help us to understand the power of your truth tonight, how it applies in our daily lives and what purpose it serves and what you have in store for our future. In Jesus' name we pray and all of God's children said praise the Lord. Fasting and prayer are a combination that increases your spiritual strength exponentially. Here's the story of Matthew 17. A desperate father with a demon-possessed son comes to the disciples and he says, you follow Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ has power over demons. I want you to pray for my son that this demon leaves him. And they pray for the boy and the demon does not come out. They do it right. They pray in Jesus' name. They pray according to what they've seen done previously. However, regardless of how hard they try, they just cannot get the child to be delivered. So they bring the child to Jesus, and Jesus immediately speaks to the demon spirit in the child, and the demon immediately leaves. Now, it's a very natural thing for us to see this and us to say, well, that's because they were Peter, James, and John, and he was Jesus Christ. What choice did the demon have? He just met someone who was bigger and stronger than him. But that's not at all the case. Jesus didn't look at the disciples and tell the disciples, the only reason I did this and you can't is because I'm perfect me and you're imperfect you. He looked at them and he said, these do not come out, but by what? Fasting and prayer. Now, when you read this topic in this chapter, there are a number of things you can discuss. You can discuss God's power over demons. You can discuss deliverance. You can discuss faith. Tonight, I choose to look at the topic of fasting and prayer. Fasting and prayer, or a lack thereof, wasn't even the reason why the demon didn't come out. Jesus Christ tells his disciples, you couldn't cast out this demon because you didn't believe. You put out the right amount of effort, but you didn't believe that the effort you were putting out was going to have any effect. Have you ever knelt down to pray and ask God for something, and before you even opened your mouth, you wondered, is this going to help? If that's your mindset, you've defeated yourself before you even get started. The disciples went to work at doing the deed of deliverance, but they went to work with their hearts and their minds in conflict with their spirit. Physically and mentally, they were telling themselves, well, this is how Jesus does it, but I don't know if it's going to work when I do it. And therefore, they weren't able to conquer the power and principality. But Jesus Christ let the disciples know, even if you did believe, even if you believed that you had the power to get the demon out of that boy, you didn't do what was required of you before you came to this moment in time. You didn't accomplish victory by preparation, and the way you prepare for spiritual victory is through fasting and prayer. Right now, there are teams that are fighting for playoff position in the NFL. They play on Sunday. They play on Monday. They play on Thursday. They play on Saturday. But do you know what they do the rest of the week? They prepare to play. Do you know what they do in the off season? They prepare for next season. They don't sit at home and eat potato chips and decide they're going to get up and do a couple of stretches and go win the Super Bowl. They are either playing or they are preparing to play. When you are in an army, you are either fighting or you are preparing to fight. 
When you're in the army of the living God, you are either in spiritual warfare or you are preparing for spiritual warfare. And the way that you prepare for spiritual warfare is by fasting and prayer. You don't wait for the problem to come to you and say, excuse me, could we call a 40-day timeout so that I can go spiritually prepare myself for what I'm up against right now? You've got to be ready before you get there. This boy had a spiritual problem that could not be overcome by just normal spiritual means. It had to have more strength, and that strength only comes through fasting and prayer. You don't know what's waiting for you in 2016. I believe God has great things in store for you, but with those great things, there's going to be great struggle. Why? Because if God wants you to have it, the devil wants to take it away. Read the book of John. Jesus Christ said, I've come to give you life more abundantly. The enemy has come but to rob, to kill, and to destroy. There is going to be a very real struggle in the success of your next year because success does not come struggle-free. And if you're going to have the ability and the strength to overcome what is coming against you, you have got to be prepared. The way you prepare is through fasting and prayer. These kinds of spiritual problems must be attacked before they arrive. I'm going to say that again. These kinds of spiritual problems must be attacked before they arrive. And therefore, you need to know why fasting works. First, fasting is proactive, it's not reactive. Say that with me. Fasting is proactive, it is not reactive. When a problem arises, most of the time we think about fasting. But the Bible doesn't tell us whenever you get in real trouble, pray about fasting. The Bible says, Jesus Christ speaking, when you fast. Say that with me. When you fast. The fact of the matter is... Fasting was not something that was set aside for the super spiritual charismatic elite. Fasting was something that God expected every one of his children to do. Daniel fasted. Paul fasted. Jesus Christ fasted. If these men of God fasted, he expects us to do the same. Fasting is not something that you volunteer for. Fasting is something that you willingly do because it gives you the opportunity to access more power with God. When you fast, Jesus said, do it in a way that brings glory to God. Why? Because if you do it to glorify yourself, then the glory of men is all that you'll receive. Jesus said in Matthew 16 and 24, if any man come after me, let him deny himself. Say that with me. Let him deny himself. Fasting is the denial of of self it is when you say to king stomach you go sit down because i'm pursuing king jesus you say that sounds pretty simple it sounds simple but it's real hard fasting is a denial of your physical desires it's a basic and practical way for you to demonstrate that you are pursuing desiring craving and seeking god Do you know what you're demonstrating when you're going to work every day? You're demonstrating through your work every day that you are pursuing, desiring, and seeking the things that the work of your hands can give you. You're pursuing more possessions. There's nothing wrong with that. You're pursuing more of an income. There's nothing wrong with that. When you set aside your physical need for things like breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you say, God, I'm going to feast on your word, you are showing a very real demonstration that you are pursuing, seeking, and craving the things of God. Matthew chapter 6, Christ addresses the issue of fasting throughout the chapter. He says, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. What a contrary message, considering how much we comfort ourselves with food in the world in which we live. Don't worry about what you're going to eat. Come on, preacher, you got to be done on time because dinner is waiting. But Jesus Christ said, seek first the kingdom. He made it very clear, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Father. 
He was letting us know that there's something more powerful in this life than the food you put in your mouth. It is the food that comes from the Word of God. How can you physically demonstrate that you're seeking after God? Fast. How do you fast? Here's how I fast. The first thing that comes to my mind that I don't want to give up, that's the first thing I give up. God, I'm going to fast for you. Ribeye. Doggone it. (laughs) If it doesn't mean anything to you, it won't mean anything to God. Why? Consider this. We are a threefold being. Jesus Christ in Genesis, God the Father and the Holy Spirit in the dust of Eden said, let us make man in our image. Just as God is triune, we are triune. He is Father, Son, and Spirit. We are spirit, soul, and flesh. The spirit portion of us belongs to God. It is born of God when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior. The only thing that our spirit can feed on is the Word of God, the bread of eternal life. Just like children need milk, the Word of God is milk for babes. Just like men need meat, the Word of God is meat for men. It is spiritual milk, it is spiritual meat, and it's all that you can feed your spirit, and your spirit becomes strong. Now, the same way that you feed your spirit, you feed your flesh. You feed your flesh at Chamagaucha. Just flip that little thing over to green, and they'll feed you till you need a wheelbarrow to push you out. That is preparation and practice for the married supper of the lamb over there. You need to go try it out. You feed your flesh at any of the places that you like to go find on all of your favorite apps that tell you about all of the foodies in all the towns that you've ever gone to. I've never seen so many pictures of so many plates of food as I have since smartphones came out. We used to just eat. Now we have art. But the same way you feed your spirit with the meat and the bread of the word of God, you feed your flesh with the meat and the bread of your daily table. Now the problem is when you overfeed your flesh, it becomes strong. And when you underfeed your spirit, it becomes weak. Now remember, we are a triune being. There's a man stuck in the middle and that's the soul. If the flesh is strong and the spirit is weak, the soul is stuck in a tug-of-war with a guy who can pull 10 tons and another guy who can't pull 10 pounds. And therefore, whenever your soul is in the balance of deciding whether or not you're going to do God's will or do your will, the voice of your flesh is thunderous because you fed it so well, and the voice of your spirit is anemic because it's starved to death. So whenever you begin to search for spiritual answers, your spirit is talking with a whisper because it doesn't have enough strength to shout at the flesh. And your flesh is going, hey, you know you want to get mad at your enemy? Yes, I want to get mad at your enemy. Good, slap him. And your spirit's going, bless and curse not. Be quiet over there. Most of the time, we waste our energy blaming the devil for problems we cause. And the reason these problems are caused is because we're living a life out of balance. We've overloaded our five senses, sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. And we've underwhelmed our spirit and the soul is caught here in the balance. And we like to say the devil made me do it. But the truth is you just threw a flesh fit. The devil made you do it wrong. You just lost your temper. The devil made you do it wrong. You just like to hear gossip, so you decided to spread some. The devil made you do it? No, your flesh got tempted, your spirit was too weak, and your soul said, okay. So the only way that you overcome this is that you refuse to give the flesh what it wants and you give the spirit what it needs. 
And then the spiritual side of you begins to gain strength and the soul can listen to another voice. And then when that temptation comes, the spirit says, hey, this is the way, walk in it. And the soul goes, you're right. That's exactly what we should do. But that doesn't happen overnight. Amen. Amen. So you give the soul the strength that it needs and the support that it needs to achieve spiritual success by weakening the flesh. You say you have a Bible verse for that? Absolutely. The Bible says, I must decrease that he might increase. Do you know where the he portion of him lives in me? In my spirit. And if I'm going to allow him to increase, I have to listen to his voice that is written in his word I have to feast on this bread more than I do the things of this world. There is a right and there is a wrong way to fast, just as there is a right and there is a wrong way to pray. If you fast to, to receive the attention of others, then all you'll have is their self-centered reward. I've seen people, I'm getting ready to prepare myself for a 40-day fast. Please email me all of your requests that I can carry them before the throne while I starve myself. Golf clap. God says when you fast, do it in a secret way. Do it in a way that he knows about it. Don't come to work chewing on the eraser of your pencil. I haven't eaten in five days and I'm doing it for Jesus. Do it in a way that God sees it privately so that he can reward you publicly. If you fast and you want to consecrate this next year with a fast, do it between you and God. Don't do it with a billboard. Because the more you promote yourself, the less you give God room to promote you. God has a promotion scale for you that will blow your mind. You just got to get out of his way to let him do it. We are a self-promoting generation. And the greatness of the past was promoted by God in an instant. Ask Joseph. Joseph didn't go out and print business cards that said, I'm a dreamer. Joseph had a dream and God promoted him through the dream to the palace. Ask David. David didn't have a robe made as a prize fighter killing giants before he ever faced Goliath. David said, I'll do God's will even if it means I have to face a giant. They did their thing privately and God promoted them publicly. When you are willing to serve God privately and pray effectively and fast supernaturally, when the giant comes against you, you are prepared that whatever weapon you pick up, even if it's as simple as a sling and a stone, whenever you let it fly, the hand of God is on that stone to take out the giant that is coming against you. And with all of the nation watching, God will do more for you in a day than you could do for yourself in 10 lifetimes. You may not be facing a giant right now, but there could be one coming around the corner in 2016. If you'll start fasting now, if you'll start praying now, when he stands before you and he utters his threats, you'll be able to say to him, you come to me with spear and sword, but I come to you in the name of the Lord, and God will grant you a victory greater than you've ever known before, but it doesn't happen by accident. It happens by fasting and prayer. Don't wait until the world is falling apart before you ask God to put it back together. Keep your world together by preparing for what God is taking you to today. When you fast, according to Scripture, when you pray, according to Scripture, you are tapping into the power that works because God said it would work. When you pray, you're talking to an almighty God, not a God of sometimes and maybe. You are talking to a God who is faithful and true. You are talking to a God whose word is alive and powerful. You are talking to a God who has never failed, and I promise you, he will not begin to fail with you. God has power. 
When you fast and pray, his power becomes yours. Jesus Christ said about demon powers, these come out but by fasting and prayer. If you have supernatural battles that have been taking place in your family for generations, it is time for you to come against them with the power of fasting and prayer and break those generational curses off of your family this day and forevermore. If you have sickness that is in your family, the healing touch of God is moved by fasting and prayer. If you have doubt and depression in your family. The joy of the Lord that makes rich and adds no sorrow can be anointed upon your entire household through the power of fasting and prayer. When you fast and when you pray, you are talking to a God who can do things for you that no one else can. He is a mighty God, great and greatly to be praised, and he deserves your very best. Why does God do what he does? We fooled ourselves into believing that when we fast, God responds. That's wrong. When we give, God gives back. That's wrong. Those are the outcomes of your behavior, but why does God do what he does? God doesn't do what he does because we do what we do. God doesn't do what he does because he likes us so much. The truth is God is love and God loves you unconditionally. But the reason that God does what he does is because he said he would. God is faithful to his own word, not to your behavior. Through your behavior, you can participate in his faithfulness, but your behavior does not dictate God's. People say, well, I'm going to fast and I'm going to pray and then God's going to do what I want. No, you're going to fast and you're going to pray and then you're going to do what God wants. So here's how and why fasting and prayer works. 2 Timothy 2 and 13, it says, Even when we are faithless, he remains faithful because he cannot deny himself. His behavior is not determined by ours. If it was, then he would be no better than a pagan god. All of the mythological gods, Jupiter, Zeus, Saturn, all of them, they looked down upon what men were doing, and if they didn't like it, they hit them with a lightning bolt. That's not what our God does. I'll prove it to you. The psalmist said, from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same, the name of the Lord should be praised. Well, I can assure you that there have been plenty of days where God's name has been treated with a lot less respect than what that verse declares. And even when we don't do what we should do in accordance to God's word, God doesn't say, well, tomorrow, because they didn't praise me all day today, I'm just going to turn off the sun. No. He's faithful even when we are faithless because he cannot deny himself. Therefore, the sun rises in the morning and his mercies are renewed. Not because we did or did not deserve it, but because he said he would do it. That's why fasting is such a powerful thing. Because Jesus Christ said, when you fast, this is what God would do. When you fast, God said he would restore Isaiah 58 and 6, it says, Is this not the fast I have chosen to loose the bonds of wickedness, to undo heavy burden, to let the oppressed go free, that you break every yoke? Say that with me. That you break every yoke. How many of you have yokes in 2015 you want broken in 2016? Then be willing to fast because God said when you fast, he'll break every yoke. And if God said he'll do it, then that's exactly what he'll do. You may be in this place struggling with bonds of wickedness tonight, things that beset you and hold you back, things that torment you and keep you from accomplishing your best. The only way to overcome them is not through your willpower, but through God's almighty power. And the only way to receive God's almighty power is to fast. You may be walking here under a heavy burden. You may have a yoke that is around your neck. You may have a burden of heartache and guilt. You may have shame and despair and fear 
of the past. If you want that off of you, then fast and pray. If you're oppressed by the past that you can't forget, then fast and pray. If you've got problems at your job that you can't solve, then fast and pray. If you're concerned about the culture and the direction of this nation, then fast and pray. If you've got a struggle in your heart, in your home, in your health, then fast and pray because God said, when you fast, I'll break the yoke. I'll bring you liberty and whom the Son sets free is free indeed. God not only does what he does to bring glory to his name, but God expects there to be an appropriate response to his will in your life. Matthew 5 and 48, it says, Your Father in heaven is perfect. Say that with me. Your Father in heaven is perfect. How many of you have ever had trouble following God's plan? He went right when you thought he should have gone left. Well, I assure you, whenever you're having trouble following his plan, he's not. He's perfect. He doesn't make mistakes. Not only is he flawless all by himself, but everything he does is equally without flaw. Not only is he a masterpiece, but it's also the work of his hands, masterful. And therefore, God expects you to appreciate his work and not take it for granted. When you fast, you are demonstrating your appreciation for the spirit of God that is in you that is born of God. You are saying, I don't want to become greater. I want you to become greater. I want less of me and I want more of you. Sometimes that's an easy lyric to sing, but it's a hard line to live. When Christ fasted, he said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of, his, out of the mouth of God. He was quoting the book of Deuteronomy. He was letting us understand that the word of God was in him and the word of God is what he was living on whenever he wasn't living on food. Now many people say, well, if I fast, I'm going to die. No, I'm here to tell you, you'll think you're dying, but you won't die. Some people say, well, I have medical conditions. You have them and God knows about them, but there's something that God can be glorified in if you'll lay it on the altar. As you receive more strength and nourishment from his word, you'll be able to accomplish greater spiritual things in your life. When you fast from physical bread and you feast on spiritual bread, in doing so, you demonstrate that you appreciate God's power in your life. How many of you have ever heard of comfort food? How many of you have ever had some? How many of you are looking forward to some about 8 o'clock? Got some leftovers in the fridge right now. When it comes to your spirit... This is comfort food. This is what you can read and live upon that will take every affliction and make that burden easy and that yoke light. This is what you can take in your hand and receive strength in your greatest hour of weakness. This is where encouragement comes from when your soul is downcast and your heart is broken. This is what you can read whenever you're sitting in a personal penitentiary and receive freedom from every bond and every chain and every cell that would ever hold you captive. You need to get your facts straight and the facts are found in the word of God. The facts may be, the, the statistics may be against you, but the word of God says that you can do all things through Christ. You can can overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil whenever you pick up this two-edged sword and you put it to use in your life. Your circumstance may be greater than your ability, but it's not greater than God's ability, and the only place you discover his power and his might is in his word. The question when it comes to fasting is not will God move. The question is will we move in agreement with God? 
God's word is God's will. Say that with me. God's word is God's will. You cannot have what God's will will not allow. And God's will for your life is found in his word. The general will and the specific will. He does what he does because he's loyal to his word. And so when you fast, you are coming into agreement with his word. You're saying, God, my desire, I'm laying on the altar. My desire for natural things, my desire for my will, my desire for my direction, I'm setting it aside and I'm asking you to take control. God will honor it. If he didn't, if he wouldn't honor it, he would have told you so. Read the book of Joel. In the book of Joel, there is a nation that is being tormented by a series of calamities. No matter what they do, they can't seem to get back on their feet. The prophet Joel is sent to the nation of Israel and he describes it as a barren wasteland. He says, everything that you've attempted to do has been destroyed. All of your crops have been eaten by locusts. All of your fields are without any grain. All of your harvests have been dried up. All of your wine is ruined. All of your oil fails. Economically, physically, spiritually, you're suffering. And then he says in Joel 2, 15 and 16, consecrate a fast. Stop trying to achieve success through your strength and tap into my strength and let me restore you. Sanctify the congregation. And in Joel 2 and 25, it says, after you consecrate the fast, I'll restore to you. Say that with me. I'll restore to you the years the locusts have eaten. Now, what does that mean? When God restores, it doesn't mean that he just allows you to prosper again. Let's use it in our modern calendar. Let's say that the year 2010 was a year that the locusts ate, and the year 2011 was the year that the locusts ate, and the year 2012, 13, and 14, and 15 were the year that the locusts ate. You consecrate a fast and God allows that hindrance to be broken off of your life. 2016, you become productive again, but when God restores to you the years that the locust ate, he gives back to you the six years that you lost whenever you weren't productive because he has the ability to do exceedingly and abundantly above all that you could ever ask, think, or imagine. You can come up with ways to catch up. God can come up with ways to get you ahead. But you've got to fast. So I just don't understand how going hungry is going to make it any better. See, that's the wonderful thing about faith. God didn't ask you to understand it. He just asked you to do it. God said, I'll restore financially he said i'll restore emotionally he said when you fast verse 25 through 32 he said you'll never be put to shame shame is an emotional problem and god says when you fast i will take the shame off of your life here's how he ends the chapter he said once you consecrate this fast i'll pour out my spirit on all flesh and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be delivered my prayer for this church for 2016 is that we would receive an outpouring of God's Spirit on all flesh. On those who are expecting it and those who aren't expecting it. Say, what do you mean, preacher? In every congregation, there are people who are hungering and thirsting after God. Most of them come to church on Sunday night at 630. You can tell first and second service I said so. And they expect good things to come from God. And then there are other people in the congregation that 
They hope good things come from God, but they don't really know whether or not it's going to happen. Last Sunday night, we talked about Peter and John who were on their way to the temple. They were expecting a good thing from God. There was a man with a cup begging for change. He didn't know if anything good was going to happen. Two were expecting, one wasn't expecting, but all three of them were touched by the power of God. The way revival starts is when people who are expecting good things from God not only receive them, but they receive them in such an excessive way that people who aren't expecting good things from God begin to experience good things from God, and in their experience, they understand that the power of God is real. What I'm saying is, is I want this church to demonstrate to this city in 2016 that the power of Almighty God is real, it is alive, and it is for today. But how do we get there? Fasting and prayer. We don't get there because we want it. We don't get there because... We try hard. We get there because we're willing to do what God's word has said. Jesus Christ fasted for the first 40 days of his earthly ministry. With 40 days, he consecrated three years. I believe if you will set aside time in the first month of this next year to consecrate your year unto God, God will be faithful to his word. He will restore He will empower, he will anoint, he will break yokes of bondage, he will give you victory over your enemies, he will pour out his spirit, and all who call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be delivered. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. Can we stand in the presence of the Lord? Bow your heads. Heavenly Father, tonight we've heard from your word and we've been challenged by it. Now I pray that you would give us understanding so that we may seek you and in seeking you we may find that your power is alive, that your word is real, that your truth endures forever. Father, there are needs in this congregation, spoken and unspoken, and we believe that your word is able to overcome them. So we commit ourselves to a lifestyle of fasting, prayer, and faith believing, knowing that we can indeed do all things through Christ. Tonight, the word that has been spoken, let it be seed that is sown into our hearts that will not return void in days to come. And give us a desire to let God arise and his enemies be scattered in this next year like never before. We believe that you've placed us on this earth for such a time as this. And in doing so, God, we ask that you give us the power and the strength to achieve your perfect plan, your purpose, and your will. Let us decrease that you might increase. Let your word be declared with boldness. Let your power be seen with great authority and might. In your precious name we pray and ask. And all of God's children said praise the Lord. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. I look forward to seeing you New Year's Eve at 11 o'clock. If not, from our house to yours, have a blessed New Year.